Hi everybody, uh, welcome to a lecture on the immune system. Uh, this one was at least minorly troublesome to kind of get together. The first bits of this are pretty straightforward from my perspective. Uh, but then, once you get into the terminal portions of it, we'll say uh, it's really a challenge to see how deep you want to go down the rabbit hole. There are whole classes taught on immunology, and you can certainly take one one of these days. And I'm here to tell you that this lecture encompasses a broad spectrum of material. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a stab at going through and hitting the most important parts that are uh, feasible for a class like ours and see where it takes us from there. All right, so with that in mind, Let's talk about non-specific and specific immunity. But first things first, I think there's another conversation to have. And that is to say that microbes in our world are very abundant. There are things around, on, and in us all the time, constantly. I, I say this to my students all the time, but you have, you have more bacterial cells in and on you than you have human cells in your system. All right? They're just a great deal smaller and vastly, vastly more numerous. Uh, so we are surrounded by microscopic organisms on a daily basis. And most of them don't cause us any problems at all. In fact, the pathogenic microbes are very rare in the grand scheme. All right? So if you like good cheese, thank you microbes. All right? If you like beer, thank you microbes. Uh, we even have a lot of medications that we have synthesized as a result of genetically augmented uh, bacterial species, like insulin, for example. Insulin is uh, packaged into a plasmid, inserted into, I believe it's an E. coli species of bacterium, but don't quote me on that. And we utilize these to man uh, manufacture insulin. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is that the vast majority of microbes in the world around us, right, the vast majority, are not a problem, but there are pathogens that can hurt us. So because there are pathogens, because they have the ability to hurt us, let's see if I can augment this camera a little, we need to have a way of protecting ourselves. All right, before we go any further, let's have a conversation on some of the potential issues out there. So bacteria, bacteria are indeed prokaryotic, uh, single-celled organisms, very simplistic interiorly, very small compared to the size of a human cell. So if this is a decent sized human cell, that would be a massive bacterial cell, right? Bacteria are normally vastly smaller uh, than our eukaryotic cells. And then this would be like the mother of all viruses, all right? Normally a viral particle is like a little bitty speck compared to a bacterium. So eukaryotic cells are very large, uh, bacteria are tiny by comparison to a eukaryotic cell, and then viral particles are, are just microscopic. Absolutely just beyond belief small. you, you got to have an electron scope to really see most of them. All right, uh, so bacteria are indeed prokaryotic. Uh, they have, let's see, what do I want to say here? Well, let me just jump straight on down here. Uh, the real fear with a lot of bacteria, the toxins that they produced, uh, produce, I should say. So we have to have means of defending ourselves, not just against the bacterium, but also their toxins. And I will uh, kind of explain that as we progress through this. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail. I don't think it's that necessary. Um, so let's just jump over here to a virus. So a bacterium, what they're going to do is they're going to set up shop in your tissues and their goal is to find food. Okay, not unlike your goal as a living organism. So they're going to consume your tissues, uh, and then they will release byproducts that are potentially toxic. Uh, we want to get rid of them from our bloodstream, from our uh, general tissues, because they will try to consume um, our cellular parts. Okay, so we want to get them out of there because they're trying to eat on us. So we do our best to get rid of them. Uh, when they are doing damage to us, that makes us ill. Like imagine the sore throat from strep throat. That's when Streptococcus pyogenes gets in your throat, and starts chowing down on your mucosae. Uh, that's obviously a problem. So we want to get those out of there as best as we can. Uh, viruses are different. So what viruses do is they 
uh, attached to your cells. They enter your cells through specialized receptors activated to bring about endocytosis. So they will enter your cells and then take over your cellular machinery, make your cells stop doing what your cells should do for you, and make them start producing viral particles. So uh, what this does, again, is it shuts down the cells, makes them stop doing what they're supposed to do, makes them start uh, producing viral particles, in other words, causing you issues. Uh, and, and this is a whole host of things here. So uh, bad bacteria, bad bacteria are like Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, Staph aureus causing staph infections. Uh, bad viruses are like COVID or cold and flu and measles and chicken pox and polio and rabies. Uh, um, let me call it. Well, that'll do. That'll do. That's, that's a good idea. And uh, we will talk a little bit about AIDS as we progress as well. All right. Your immune system is basically made up of two main parts. The innate defenses or non-specific, these will defend you against anything that tries to come in and cause you issues, and then the adaptive or specific defenses. Uh, so these are broad spectrum. Uh, they will attack anything that comes at you, but they're not particularly good at it. The response is slow, you're gonna get sick, you should get better, but you're, you're gonna get sick, okay? Uh, whereas adaptive defenses, when your adaptive defenses are set up correctly, uh, they will defend you and you will not even notice that you came into contact with a pathogen. Uh, when you were a kid, you got a bunch of shots, okay? Things like an MMR vaccine as an example. That's measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, what would happen in this case is the reason that we give you that shot is to expose your body to some terrible, terrible pathogens. Now, we expose you to versions of them that shouldn't hurt you. All right, that's the idea here. But exposing you to terrible pathogens all the same. And then what will happen is your adaptive defenses will realize that you've been exposed to those things. It will begin to recognize those potentially very dangerous items and then will attack and destroy them without your body even having damage. Okay, so this setup is going to be like your special forces. Okay, your adaptive defenses uh, are going to be incredibly potent when you're exposed to a pathogen, they will attack and destroy it without it having any chance to cause you any problems, but it has to be exposed to that pathogen first. And we'll be talking more about that in a second. So where we're gonna start is up here with the innate defenses. These will defend you in any way, shape, or form, however is possible at this very moment or whenever is necessary. Your innate defenses will take care of you. Now, we tend, <clears throat> We tend to divide, divide all this up into three basic portions, and that is a first line of defense, which is your surface barriers, skin, mucous membranes, what have you. Your second line of defenses, which are internal defenses. So if something gets through your skin, what is the first thing to slow it down and stop it? Well, that would be your major phagocytic cells, a fever, special cells called natural killers. Okay, natural killer cells, super cool, love the name antimicrobial proteins, which we'll get into in a little while, and general inflammation. So these are ways of slowing down pathogens once they've gotten into your body, but in a very open, general way. So this, like, fever affects your whole body. It's not one specific pathogen. Inflammation affects an entire area of the body, not just one specific pathogen. Whereas you'll have adaptive defenses just for polio. You'll have adaptive defenses just for measles. So have adaptive defenses just for COVID, all right? So uh, surface barriers, internal defenses like phagocytes, they are innate, they are non-specific, they work on everything. Whereas your adaptive defenses are very, very specific and they have memory. So once they help you, they'll be able to take care of you from then on, okay? They develop memory. All right, good. Uh, the innate defenses. So your first line of defense are your surface barriers. Man, let me tell you, your skin is a wonderful barrier against potential pathogens. It's a tremendous means of protecting you against really terrible things. Think about your skin surface. Uh, your skin surface is very thick. The outer layer is dead. The secretions of your skin 
uh, give rise to a whole bunch of super tough protein that can't really be utilized up here in the top of the skin. The secretions of your skin are dermicidal, bactericidal, and acidic. So the surface of the skin is absolutely toxic. Okay, absolutely toxic to a lot of different bacterial strains. And uh, further, you have cells that hang out right underneath the surface that are hardcore phagocytes, uh, very good at defending you. So your skin is a rough place for bacteria to be, is what I'm trying to tell you, all right? An absolutely rough place for bacteria to be. And your mucous membranes as well. So your mucous membranes will produce mucus. Uh, that mucus will trap potential pathogens. And in a lot of cases, like in your trachea, for example, uh, you have cilia there that will move debris up and out of any potentially um, uh, susceptible tissues, if you will. All right. All right. I think that'll do. So let's make sure we got everything we need here. So we got our acid mantle, uh, acidic secretions from our skin surface. Uh, direct to toxicity, we have absolutely some bactericidal and dermicidal chemicals that are released there. Uh, your stomach is very good at protecting you by having a hydrochloric acid production that takes place in there. Uh, so any bacteria that are trying to get into your body via things that you consume, the hydrochloric acid of the stomach tends to kill them. In fact, uh, there's really only one bacterium that can live in the stomach, and we'll talk about them later, I think. Uh, your saliva, your eyes, your tears, yeah, your tears, uh, they produce a substance called lysozyme. Uh, it's really an enzyme called N-acetylmuramide glycanohydrolase, but, you know, we as humans, we like the simpler versions these days, so it's just called lysozyme. And uh, lysozyme is a potent antibacterial agent, all right? So your saliva kills bacteria, okay? Your tears kill bacteria. We produce this stuff all over the place, man. And uh, last but not least, again, mucus itself does indeed trap microorganisms that can then be dealt with in other ways. And further, something that your book really doesn't talk about, I feel like you can't leave this out, is your natural flora. Remember I said that we are covered and we are filled with bacteria as we speak. And these bacteria, in a lot of cases, uh, are like in a deep familial line. So you've had uh, certain bacteria in your gut that are the same basic bacteria as like your mom or dad has, that are the same as like their grand or your grandparents or your great grandparents. Going way on back is what I'm trying to tell you. So you have these bacterial lines uh, that are hanging out in your tissues that have been hanging out in people's tissues for a long time. And you got to think about this like an apartment building. If your body is an apartment building and all the rooms are full, then nothing bad can move in. Okay. Uh, the problem is when we take a broad spectrum antibiotic or something like that. Uh, it'll kill all of our natural bacteria, and then you have a real chance of picking up dangerous things afterwards. Now, now, don't take me as saying the wrong thing here. It's good to take your medications if they are prescribed, because that probably means you got a bigger problem. But I'm just telling you, there can be side effects that you need to keep in mind. So, like, for instance, uh, if you take a broad-spectrum antibiotic, Oftentimes, a doctor will recommend that you also take some probiotic pills to reestablish your intestinal flora. That's to keep you from getting, um, oh geez, is it Clostridium difficile? There's a, it's difficile, C. diff, uh, is a really nasty gut bacterium uh, that just runs through, like, uh, nursing homes, for example, like wildfire. Super scary, dangerous stuff. And it's all from having improper gut bacteria. So it's pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. All right. Ah, let's see, so the second line. So when your surface barriers are breached, man, then you've got other cells, interior, and uh, some other molecules, not just cells, but some antimicrobials as well, uh, that will then take over and help defend you in a very non-specific, general way. Okay, a very non-specific, general way. So anything that comes in, okay, anything that comes in, you've got, for instance, phagocytic cells like macrophages uh, that'll, that are going to set up shop, and they're going to attack and destroy whatever it is. Now, they are not tremendously... Well, don't let me undersell this, okay? When I say they're not very good at it, what I mean by that is that you're still going to get sick. Okay, if you've got a bacterial infection and it's spreading through your system, well, hey, man, let me tell you. You're going to have monocytes hanging out there and neutrophils. You're going to have phagocytic cells, big macrophages. You're going to have natural killers that are cruising through, mopping the floor with anything they find that's not supposed to be there. But you're still going to be sick. 
you're still going to have tissue damage. You're going to get better, let's hope, probably. You're probably going to get better. <laughs> no, unless you got other problems, you're going to get better. Uh, but you're going to get sick when you're just relying on these phagocytes and, and, and other related cells, okay? Uh, so let's go through and talk about some of these a little bit and see where it takes us. The main leukocytes we're worried about here are neutrophils and monocytes, and you'll see why that is in just a second. All right, neutrophils. Uh, these are indeed the most abundant white blood cells, and they, they cruise around your bloodstream. They, they uh, cruise through your lymphatic system. They, they circle all around your cardiovascular networks, and they look for potential problems, okay? Uh, they are phagocytic. Quite simply, they consume via endocytosis uh, potential dangerous pathogens, bacteria. Think about, like, uh, you get um, cut by something and some bacteria get into your bloodstream. Well, you've got, you're have you going to have neutrophils that are going to cruise through and bust those up, okay? Now, in emergencies, okay, in emergencies, these neutrophils are not just phagocytic. They have other means of dealing with bacteria. They can produce a cloud of antibacterial chemicals. They, they, they broadcast this stuff and really tear up uh, whole groups of bacteria further. Uh, in this, well, hang on, I want to get down here. Uh, <laughs> they, they will be capable of what are called respiratory bursts. Okay, so that's where this neutrophil will absorb oxygen and build what are called free radicals. Okay, in essence, you got to think about this. You, you may have seen commercials where, like, uh, go and watch a palm, wonderful pomegranate commercial. They're going to talk about how if you drink this juice, it's got antioxidants that takes care of free radicals. All right, well, free radicals are very dangerous uh, uh, oxic compounds, uh, and they will destroy bacteria in the event that they come into contact. These neutrophils have the ability basically to fill up and burst with bleach, with really potent chemicals. Um, peroxides as an example, really, really potent chemicals, and they will just mop the floor with whole groups of bacteria, with the downside being that the uh, neutrophil also dies, okay? So they are really good at killing bacteria, but when they have to broadcast and do uh, many bacterium at once, we'll say, uh, oftentimes the neutrophil dies as well. But we have lots of these, okay? So it's not a big deal. So, so it's how they work. They are capable of phagocytic activity, and they're capable of releasing super toxic chemicals uh, that can then destroy whole groups of dangerous bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Uh, monocytes. So the thing about monocytes is that they become macrophages. Okay, and macrophages are the phagocytic cell of the body, all right? They cruise around and they phagocytize bacterium or damaged cells or what have you, okay? They are very powerfully phagocytic, very powerfully phagocytic. Uh, and let's see, I believe derivatives of these uh, are found in very specific locations. So most of the time they cruise all around the body, but we also have variants of these that set up shop in certain locations, like microglial cells are derived from monocytes, uh, and they hang out in the central nervous system. That's how your book phrases it. I had always heard that microglial cells uh, were um, neuroglia in origin, but we're going to stick with the concept that these are monocyte-related. Your book says so. Um, alveolar macrophages are hanging out in the lungs, looking for potential issues there. Uh, go and read about tuberculosis if you want to be a little scared. And then, of course, there are hepatic macrophages that are hanging in the liver. So these are strongly um, phagocytic cells. So they are derived from monocytes. Uh, and if you remember, monocytes are quite large, which makes sense because your phagocytic cells also tend to be quite large. Um, and I really want to talk about how bone reabsorption works right now, being that it's monocyte-based as well. But let's just keep rolling and see where this takes us. All right, fever. Fever is a good example of an innate defense. Fever is going to cause bacteria issues, and it doesn't matter what kind of bacterium it is. It's a broad-spectrum means of augmenting our body's function. Now, let me just lay this out for you in a very simple way. Fever is an abnormally high body temperature. Think about it like this. Your body temperature is normally like 98.6. What if it's uh, 101, 102? The reason that your body temperature would go up like that is to help you deal with 
potential pathogens, okay? Uh, your body is going to release what are called pyrogens, okay? So these are product of leukocytes, macrophages that release these pyrogens. Uh, these pyrogens will raise, they affect your hypothalamus in essence and help to raise your body temperature just a little bit. Now, you don't feel good as a result of this. You feel sick, but it helps you, okay? A little bit of a fever helps you to heal faster. Turns out if you are sick and you've got a little bit of a fever, uh, if you just kind of let it run its course, you are vastly less infective. Uh, you have a much lower chance of getting other people sick. You tend to get uh, well much quicker than if you take what are called antipyretics. Okay, antipyretics, think about medications that are fever reducers. By taking antipyretics, you um, decrease the effect of the fever, and it normally makes you sick longer and more infective to those around you. So a little bit of fever actually uh, helps your body heal faster. And this should be pretty dead gummed off, obvious. Uh, when we incubate the really nasty bacteria, okay, this is blood auger, and uh, these are beta hemolytics, so they've gone through, these bacteria are busting up red blood cells and absorbing nutrients from them. That's some nasty stuff right there. Uh, this has to be incubated at human body temperature to work. The bacteria work at human body temperature. If you put them up at like 102, Man, let me tell you, they are not happy. They do not hemolyze in the same fashion. They do not work as well. When your body temperature is a little higher, the stuff that normally would cause you problems, the pathogens, they just don't do as well, all right? So it helps you to heal faster. Uh, and how, what's the premise behind this? Uh, a lot of this is, is theoretical, all right? But I'm gonna lay it on you anyway. The idea is that this should increase the general mobility of your white blood cells. Uh, it should make them better capable of being phagocytic by making them work more quickly. Uh, it is shown quite clearly uh, that bacteria that are raised at slightly higher than body temperatures tend to produce far less endotoxins. All right, so that's good. That's a good thing. Endotoxins can be incredibly dangerous. These are chemicals released by bacteria that cause major damage to our systems. Um, and I don't even want to talk about it because it scares me to death. <laughs> Go and look up hemorrhagic E. coli. It is terrifying. Uh, the idea behind these hemorrhagic E. coli is that when they get in your system, uh, it's not a big deal. We can give you medication that'll kill the heck out of them. But if we do that and they die, they release endotoxins that will tear the insides of your uh, intestinal tract up. And, and it's super bad. Okay, it's just accept that it's super bad. Uh, so dealing with them is hard. So these endotoxins are quite scary. Uh, they will, the, the fever, will increase the development of your T-cells, uh, so they will become more active faster. And, and here's a neat one, okay? This is something I learned building your lecture for today. I'd never heard this before. Uh, but when you have an elevated temperature, it's been shown that your liver holds a little bit of excess iron. It keeps it out of the bloodstream. And if you're not aware, uh, fer uh, ferric compounds, iron-based compounds, uh, they are very important for general cell division, okay? Um, by the liver sequestering and holding on to iron, that would prevent or at least decrease the amount that was freely available to bacteria trying to grow in your system, and that would make them less able to grow and develop. So by sequestering iron, uh, this keeps a key growth-based um, uh, material out of the hands of the enemy, so to speak. And that's pretty neat. I'm sure the effect is not super powerful, uh, but you combine them all together and you've got a really nice way of helping deal with potential pathogens. So that's great. Uh, natural killer cells. I mean, you know, this is one of those I like. Uh, just the name makes me happy. These are indeed lymphocyte derived, but they are quite nonspecific. These behave a lot like what are called... Um, T or, or type of T cell. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but well, I guess I have it on the daggum slide, so let's talk about it. They behave a whole bunch like a cytotoxic T cell. The difference is that a cytotoxic T cell is incredibly specific. It will only attack a very specific pathogen, whereas natural killer cells will attack any pathogen they come across. Okay? Anything they find that has the appropriate, what's called major histocompatibility complex protein network, what we'll call them MHCs. We're going to talk more about that here in a second. If these natural killer cells find anything that isn't you, that's the idea, 
okay? Your cells, they're gonna pick up that it's your cells and not be at all worried about it. But if they find anything foreign, these natural killer cells are gonna set up shop and they're gonna destroy it. And one of the super neat ways that they do this is by releasing uh, these protein networks called perforins, okay? Uh, what perforins do is really neat. They will poke holes in any foreign cell that they come across and much like you, if something pokes holes in you, you're not long for this world, okay? Well, when the natural killer cell pokes holes in an enemy cell, like a bacterium, uh, that cell's internal complements are going to leave. Uh, the natural killer cell has the ability to further release what are called granzymes. It's going to go in and bust up all the interior bits of this cell. Uh, think of these almost like a lysosome, in essence. And that's going to lead to the cell being destroyed, okay? And then that destroyed cell will be taken in by a macrophage, and boy, let me tell you, it just goes on from there. Uh, that phagocytic process with that macrophage, uh, that macrophage is then going to go and basically, well, what the heck, I'll just explain. That, that macrophage is going to strip the exterior markers off of whatever the heck this was, and it's going to go and show those markers to all of your really intense, like cytotoxic T's, for example, and say, hey, y'all need to look out for this specific pathogen, and that's going to set your specific immune response up and get it ready to rock and roll on anything that comes in that matches that exterior marker. Um, I know that I just laid a little bit extra on you, but trust me when I say it's going to make perfect sense in like an hour when we're done with this. I hope we're done in an hour. We're going to see. Ah, and immune surveillance. So your natural killer cells are free-flowing, man. They will, it's, it's such a neat process. They flow through the blood and then they pop out of the blood, hop into your uh, lympho, um, into your lymph, into your uh, lymphatic vessels, capillaries. And then they're going to flow to your lymph nodes and they're going to hang out in your lymph nodes. Then they're going to flow back to the bloodstream, then hop back into the bloodstream and go somewhere else. It's a really neat process. These natural killer cells are super cool. And again, they are non specific, uh, they're going to work pretty well. Uh, but they're not going to work nearly as well as a adaptive immune response. And you'll see that as we progress. Natural killer cells, yet another innate defense. Uh, general antimicrobial proteins fall into a couple of different realms here. These are interferons and what's called the complement system. And boy, I'm here to tell you, complement, we could do a whole lecture just on complement. It gets very hairy very quickly. Uh, but generally speaking, what these antimicrobial proteins will do is they can bind up any kind of pathogen, stop it from being able to reproduce itself, stop it from being able to move around in your body. Uh, they will slow them down in a way that will then allow your other white blood cells to come and deal with them. So let's take a look. Interferons. Man, let me tell you, what a neat system. So what happens here is this. If a virus gets into a host cell, one of your cells, a virus gets in, and it sets up shop, uh, what can happen, this does not always happen, but what can happen is that host cell is going to release what are called interferons. Think about interference, okay? Uh, I, when I read this the first time, I was like, wow, I wonder if it's supposed to be interferon, but every anatomist I've ever known has said interferon, so we should probably go and look that up together, but I'm not going to do it. You feel free. I'm going to call them interferons because that's what I've always heard them called, but they interfere with viruses getting into adjacent cells. So this one's like, hey, I'm a goner. Uh, bad things are happening. You better get ready because bad stuff's a coming. So they'll get ready and prepare themselves for defense against whatever kind of virus this is. So where's my number one here? Okay, so virus gets into a host cell, uh, it sets up shop and starts making this host cell do its bidding. And then this host cell, once this has taken place, releases interferons uh, that will bind up the uh, sites where new viral particles could try to get into this new cell or alternatively get into that host cell and block the virus from being able to get it, for instance, your cellular machinery or block the virus, for instance, from being able to get at your genetic material. All right, it's going to stop that virus from being able to set up shop and use adjacent cells. So by one cell becoming infected, releasing interferons, 
that then binding, getting into an adjacent cell, it will prepare that adjacent cell uh, to defend itself better against whatever virus that is. So then the viruses get stuck in place and you've got natural killer cells, macrophages, they're gonna come in there and deal with any problems, okay? Uh, so yeah, 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 that'll do. So this is all part of the process, man. This is absolutely part of the process. Yeah, good, let's go here. Antimicrobial proteins, oh, compliment, oh my gosh. So the idea here is with complement is, let me just say it like this, this is super complicated. There are a lot of different parts that fall into the realm of the complement system. But what you gotta think about this is that the complement system basically makes all the other responses of your immune system work just a little bit better, okay? Works just a little bit better. The complement system helps to complement the other aspects of your immune system. Well, are you gonna have an inflammation response? Well, guess what? If you have a complement uh, response taking place with this, the inflammation response will be stronger, okay? Uh, there's just a whole host of things that takes place here. Now, for me to try to present what I can to you for the complement system in a bite-sized format is I broke this down into four major parts. Uh, these are inflammation, Okay, so general inflammation processes being amplified by complement, uh, immune clearance, phagocytosis uh, being more efficient, and what's called cytolysis. So let's go through and take a look see. Good old fashioned inflammation, uh, when complement is affecting uh, the, the way in which inflammation happens, the inflammation comes on faster, the cells are more effective with their phagocytizing, whatever's in uh, the problem here leading to the inflammation, everything just works a little bit better. All right, immune clearance is what, what I would think of as like a super cool effect of complement. Uh, so what will happen is if there are antigens flowing in your bloodstream that are potentially dangerous, uh, the effect of these complement proteins is such that they will bind these antigens and attach them to red blood cells. And then they will ride those red blood cells to like the liver and spleen and all those antigens will be cleared off and cleared out of the bloodstream. So imagine uh, you had a bacterial infection and it got into your bloodstream but your immune system destroyed those bacteria. Well, it's possible that their antibodies are still hanging out. So what will happen is uh, the complement system, through a process referred to as immune clearance, will attach to uh, those antigens, put them on red blood cells, and the red blood cells will carry them away, again, liver and spleen, uh, to be cleaned, to be cleansed out of the bloodstream. And what's amazing to, the, to me about this is those red blood cells are healthy. Uh, they're going to remove whatever the markers are on those red blood cells and let them go. Okay, absolutely let them go free of charge. All right, next. Uh, so general phagocytosis, so you have phagocytic cells that work better when complement is assisting them. Uh, the idea is, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a little while since I've thought about this, uh, but the complement basically makes uh, whatever cells that the complement attaches to easier for phagocytic cells to get a hold of and then engulf. Okay, so by having the complement in place, it increases the ability of phagocytic cells to get a hold of that bacterium, as an example, and then engulf and destroy that bacterium. So it assists with general phagocytic processes. And then last but not least, another kind of a neat aspect of this is general cytolysis. Uh, so what will happen is you have these complement proteins. They will come in and form what are called MACs. These are membrane attack complexes. They basically poke a hole in a foreign cell and that allows all the material in there to run out and will stimulate general apoptosis. So the cell wall lice, it will be destroyed, cytolysis, uh, because of these complement proteins forming these complexes that lead to that cell's destruction. So the idea behind the complement system is that it's non-specific. It'll attack everything equally. It will stimulate things like general phagocytosis. It'll stimulate inflammation responses. It'll help to clear antigens from your system. It is non-specific. Doesn't matter what it is that's making you ill, the complement system will simply help with that. Okay, it'll help. All right, and then on to general inflammation. You know, sorry about my terrible picture here. It's pretty gross. All right, so the idea with inflammation is this is a local response. Okay, think about that big toe down there. The whole body's not sick, just the big toe's sick. 
The whole body doesn't get a fever, just the big toe increases in general temperature. Uh, what we're going to do is a multifold attack on whatever it is causing us problems. So what is the general idea of inflammation? Oh, by the way, itis. Anything you hear that's an itis, like arthritis, pancreatitis, dermatitis, any itis is a local inflammation of whatever it is you're dealing with. Like dermatitis is the skin, for example. Pancreatitis is the pancreas. It's just sort of how this works. So how do we deal with this? Here we go. Uh, so the general idea of inflammation is that this will kind of block up the area and limit the spread of whatever pathogen, pathogen it is causing its problems. It'll actually sort of section off that area of the body and keep whatever it is making you sick up there. It's going to keep it out there. You can see like back here, this is all totally fine, but that looks nasty. We're keeping it separated. Okay. Uh, the inflammation response helps to enlarge the vessels of the lymphatic system. So the vessels there will get very large indeed. So they can take up excess debris, damaged cells, what have you. Uh, any bacteria that are there uh, can then move into a lymph node and be dealt with in that fashion, okay? Uh, so what this is gonna do is kind of separate everything out, increase the temperature, a means of protection. And further, by traveling back in the lymphatic system, this is going to activate your adaptive immune response. Now. This is important. You gotta imagine, you got these big old macrophages. They're hanging out in here, they're finding problems. They pick up that there's something bad there and they're gonna travel through the lymphatic system. They're gonna hang out in the lymph node and they're going to show whatever it is that's making you sick to your hardcore adaptive immune uh, cells. Okay, it's gonna alert immune responses. So what those cells will do is they'll crack loose from the lymph node travel back into the bloodstream, flow to the foot, and then attack whatever it is that's there and causing problems. Um, it was for a long time assumed that it was just random chance. Like this stuff would get into your bloodstream, it would flow around your blood, and then eventually meander to wherever it is that's uh, in need of your specialized white blood cells. But it has recently been shown that these will uh, leave a lymph node once they're activated, go back to the heart, and then be pumped directly to wherever it is that's causing you a problem. So there's way more going on than we probably realize. Uh, and that's pretty neat. Pretty neat from my perspective. Now, the cardinal signs of inflammation are indeed redness, swelling, heat, and pain. Uh, the reasoning for this is very simple. Redness, because there's increased blood flow to the area to help in the healing process. Swelling, because we're kind of cutting things off here and there's a lot of histamine being released so there's general tissue fluid building up which increases flow to the lymph nodes and protection therein heat because there's a lot of blood flow to there uh, that's going to bring a lot of heat to the area and then pain because all of this swelling is going to put pressure against your um, general touch receptors and then any further touch is going to make them release a nociceptive pain signal okay now there's an obvious question here and that is, what the heck is pus, okay? Pus, when you have a pus pocket or some sort of injury that results in a bacterial infection and it opens up and some sort of disgusting white fluid comes out of that, what that is is a bunch of dead neutrophils and typically a bunch of dead bacteria. What you're seeing when you look at pus is the result of a battlefield, man. You're seeing your dead white blood cells and a bunch of dead bacteria. It is the battlefield. It's a bunch of dead bodies uh, from your immune system trying its absolute best to protect you. All right, good. I think that'll do. Um, is that all we want to say about inflammation? Leukocytes moving quickly? Yeah, man. I think that'll do. Oh, here's a nice breakdown of this, actually. Uh, so let's talk about it. So what will happen is this. Let's say you've got a splinter that comes in and deposits some bacteria into your system. Well, when that happens, there will be certain inflammatory chemicals that are released, like histamine is a perfect example. And what that histamine, histamine is going to do is cause a localized swelling. Uh, there will also be chemical signals that are released from this uh, that result in your white blood cells moving out of the bloodstream and up into your general extracellular space to help deal with whatever bacteria is there. Now, herein lies a couple of terms that I would like for you to know. These terms are margination and diapetesis, okay? Margination and diapetesis. Margination is 
basically there are cellular adhesion molecules that are hanging out in the bloodstream down here and they will become activated when there's damage near them. So as these white blood cells are cruising through, they'll find the activated cellular adhesion molecules bind and uh, pull their way up into extracellular space to deal with those bacteria. So that active margination is where there are molecules there that bind to your white blood cells and stop them in place so they don't just keep flowing by. And then diapetesis is their process of being able to move via what's called positive chemotaxis. You should know that positive chemotaxis towards the chemicals being released by these bacteria and deal with them. So that's called diapetesis. That's the ability of these white blood cells to sort of move through your extracellular space. Uh, and the way they do it, super cool, but I am not going to go down that rabbit hole with you as well. Uh, we're just going to leave it right there. So the main goals here, main goals, we're going to try to stop this pathogen from getting into the bloodstream and spreading all around the body. We're going to use certain protein networks like fibrinogen, for example, uh, to build a mesh to block off the area and form, again, what you might call a pus pocket, an area where uh, the inflammation, an area where whatever bacterial infection is going to be contained. And then we're going to have monocytes come, turn into macrophages, and start tearing through that material like it's going out of style. So that is why we have inflammation. It's like a localized means of dealing with a problem uh, when such an effect is possible. And then we have our third line of defense, our adaptive immune system. Now, I see that the battery on my camera is very low, so I assume we've been recording for quite a while. I think what I'm going to do, being that it's pretty early on a Saturday morning here, uh, is I'm going to make this a two-parter. I'll go ahead and get this one uploaded, and then we'll do adaptive immunity and some of the negative effects of uh, immune problems uh, tomorrow. So let me go ahead and get this to you, and I hope you guys will enjoy this as best as we can. Try to, try to enjoy the cartoons. For whatever reason, the immune system has just the best ones. <laughs> Alright, have a great day, folks.